All right, welcome and thank you for attending today's Chamber University. Uh, before we get started, I wanna let you know that uh, this will be recorded for you to view later if you need to as a, uh, a person who uh, joined this Chamber University. My name is Tony Moline. I'm the CEO of the Cedar Park Chamber, and I have the uh, wonderful distinction to, to open this up. Uh, I want to take a moment to thank Cedar Park Economic Development for being our presenting sponsor for our Chamber University series this year. Uh, our speaker today will be Corporal David Amadon. Corporal Amadon attended the CTC Police Academy and gradu graduated in 2010. He was hired by the Marble Falls Police Department in 2011. He has served as a patrol officer there until 2015 when he was hired as a police officer for the Cedar Park Police Department. Corporal Amadon has served in many roles in the Cedar Park Police Department. Some of these include patrol officer, community service officer, patrol corporal, and the traffic division corporal. Uh, it is my pleasure to introduce today's program, which is the Civilian Response to Active Shooter Events, or CRAZE. Uh, Corporal Amadon is going to take it away. Please be sure to utilize the Q&A function or the chat function. We will be answering questions um, either as they arise or at the end, we should have time. So with that, I am going to turn it over to Corporal Amadon. Thank you. Hello. Uh, I appreciate everyone uh, uh, showing up. Um, this will be my first time to teach this virtual. So uh, Hopefully it translates well. Uh, let's get started. We're going to ask if you have any questions, just hold them to the end and then uh, we'll answer questions. Okay. So like Tony said, I work for Mar Falls PD from 2011-2015. I joined Cedar Park in 2015. And I've been teaching uh, CRAZE, which is Civilian Response to an Active Shooter event, uh, since 2016. So first of all, I kind of want to talk about, um, you know, Monday morning quarterbacking. And what I'm trying to convey there is we're going to dissect some situations. In law enforcement, we do that a lot, uh, the good, the bad, the ugly. And I'm not saying if I would have been in that situation, I would have come out smelling like a rose. But what we do is we dissect these situations and try to learn from them. And I just, it's important that you understand that. So first of all, uh, we're gonna talk about uh, Columbine. I uh, bet most of you remember this. I'm gonna play you a, a clip. This is from the librarian of Columbine High School. Uh, her name is Patty. And um, she is a librarian, like I said, she heard some kids out in the hallway she walks she looks down the hallway and sees two kids with a gun she thinks that you know hey these kids just have toy guns and they're messing around so she starts walking down there to challenge them and one of them shoots at her hits the glass beside her the glass comes off and like uh, breaks and hits her arm she runs back into the library and then she calls 911 so this is uh, the 911 phone call Jefferson County 911. Yes, I am a teacher at Columbine High School. There is a student here with a gun. He gets shot out a window. I believe one shot. Um, um, I've been Columbine High School. I don't know what's in my shoulder. If it was just some last week, who what? Um, okay, has anybody been injured, ma'am? Yes. Okay. Yes. And the school is in a panic, and I'm in the library. I've got students down at the table, kids. Um, kids are screaming. Some of the teachers um, are, you know, trying to take control of things. We need police here. We okay, we're getting them there. Who is the student, ma'am? I do not know who the student So you can tell from the video that she is very upset. Uh, this is one of the scariest events that she's ever been through. Um, She talks about uh, in the video, um, she later on, she, she gave an interview and she basically said that, you know, she was too scared to get up uh, and lock the doors or try to get the kids out. The 911 phone call is actually a few minutes long. In that amount of time, you know, we should be looking at what can we do to improve our situation. So whether that's, you know, locking the doors, uh, locking the doors, trying to get out of the building, 
uh, looking at that. Uh, ultimately, what happened is she was unable to lock the door. She told the kids to hide underneath the table uh, with their hands over their head, kind of like a tornado drill, because that's how she'd been, you know, that's the most training she's ever had. And the shooter came in and executed the kids. It's pretty sad. Uh, she ended up living, she found a good hiding spot and, uh, you know, that was kind of, you know, what happened that day. But like I said, in that time period, there's some things that we could do to really improve our chances of being able to survive. Uh, this is a video. Um, so alert who teaches us active shooter and, uh, we go through a lot of training. They help put this program on for civilians because they they thought, you know, we, there's so much training for law enforcement. You know, uh, initially when we started, you know, there wasn't a whole lot, but now we have a lot of training. We uh, we go to these facilities that are kind of like made for this. They move around the walls and they're able to create uh, like a school-like environment, business-like environment. And it's just really good training. And they thought, hey, let's make something so civilians can have some uh, some training and know what to do in these situations. So this is a video that they made, and I'm going to play it for you. There's a gunman inside the store. We need help now. about is the new system enhancement. What's going to be the solution by the time we... All right, thank you. Appreciate it. I actually think he's got an old... Well, he's got a truck. I don't know if your daughter would be interested. There's a gunman inside the store. He's shooting the place up. We need help now. Issues that we found. Okay, Emily, see what that is. See what's going on. Just let us know what you find out. There's a man with a gun. He's right there. Where's the wall? Okay, you're safe for that. There's a guy with a gun, he's shooting, look! James, what do I do? No, look! Run, run, run! To the right, to the right, to the loading dock! Come on, this way, this way, this way! Coming. What are we gonna do? We're gonna have to defend ourselves. I, I can't do this. You're gonna see your daughter tonight, okay? We are all going to go home tonight. All right? We have a right to defend ourselves. Get the gun! Get the gun! Hey! Hold him down, hold him down! Thank you. 
If you ever have the misfortune to be in an active shooter event, you deserve to survive. In our research, we have found that the actions that potential victims take during these events are critical to their survival. We have identified three options that have proven effective in many events. These are, avoid the attacker. Deny the attacker access to your area. Defend yourself. It is a personal decision, but you have a right to do so. Avoiding the attacker starts with being aware of your surroundings at all times and knowing what is going on around you. If you see or hear something that looks suspicious, take action. For example, the stalker took immediate and effective action to protect himself when he observed the shooter pulling out weapons from the bag. Others, however, hesitated, and this hesitation can cost them valuable time that they could have used to get away from the threat. If you hear something that is, or could be, gunfire, start trying to get away from it as soon as possible. Gunfire has a distinctive sound. Inside of buildings, the sound can be muffled or distorted. A single loud bang could be a person dropping something, or even thunder. But repeated loud bangs are much more likely to be gunfire. Additionally, look at the reaction of others. Are they startled or scared? Are they running? What are they saying? Any one of these events individually may create denial, but when put together, should create a heightened awareness and stimulate an immediate response. It is important that you know how to get out. The situation will be chaotic and rapidly changing. In general, you will want to go to the nearest exit. But you must also understand that the closest exit may not be accessible or safe to use. If this is the case, go to a different exit. While avoiding the threat, consider the uses of cover and concealment. Cover offers protection from gunfire, while concealment minimizes your exposure to the attacker. Try to keep objects between you and the attacker. If you can't avoid the attacker, sometimes the best option will be to deny the attacker access to your location. In many locations, this can be accomplished by closing and locking a door, such as they did in the meeting room. Locking the door has proven effective in many attacks. If the door does not have a lock, you can place heavy objects in front of it. Remember, barricades work best if the door opens toward you. If it doesn't, use things that are readily available, such as straps, belts, or objects that can be used to block or secure the door to make it difficult for the attacker to enter the room. This may at least slow the attacker down and give you time to identify alternate means of escape, such as adjoining rooms or windows. When attempting to deny access to your location, you want to make it appear that there is no one in your area. Lock doors, turn off the lights, silence your phones, and get out of sight. Your attempt to deny the attacker access to your location might fail. The gunman's coming. What are we going to do? We're going to have to defend ourselves. Have a backup plan about what you will do. In many cases, this may be to defend yourself. You need to be in a place where you can act if the attacker comes into your location. In most rooms, you will line up against the same wall that the door is on, near the door so you can react, but not directly in front of it. If you are unable to avoid or deny, 
your best option may be to defend yourself by using whatever is available. In a situation where someone is attempting to kill you, you have the legal right to defend yourself. Attack weak spots such as eyes, throat, and groin. Fight to the best of your ability and do not quit until the attacker is stopped. This is what the workers in the warehouse did when they were unable to avoid the attacker and felt their lives were in immediate danger. Whatever option you choose, call 911 as soon as you are in a safe location. Provide any information that you know. The operator will ask you a lot of questions. If you don't know the answer, don't guess. Just say you don't know and only state the facts. This will be a complex situation and we can't tell you what you should do in every case. What we can do is provide you with information about the options that we have found to be most effective for surviving these attacks. The ultimate choice is yours. What you do matters. Avoid the attacker. Deny access to your location. Defend yourself. Law enforcement will be entering a chaotic scene with limited information. Their first priority will be to stop the threat to your safety. The police may not know where or who the threat is. Listen and comply with their commands immediately. Put it down, put it down, sir. Put it down, both of you on the ground. Police are trained to look at people's hands to assess threats. Do not have anything in your hands that could be perceived as a weapon, such as a cell phone. Show me your hands, sir. Show me your hands, move to us. Everybody, keep your hands up, please. Walk out the door. If told to do so, stay where you are and do not make sudden movements. Again, follow all commands. Remember, what you do matters. Avoid the attacker. Deny access to your location. Defend yourself. Remember, A-D-D. You can survive. So that's just a good video to illustrate uh, the principles, you know, avoid, deny, defend. As we go through this, uh, I want you to think about how you would apply this uh, to your business, but also uh, in your personal life. So active attack events, the definition, active attack event. Attempted mass murder. Uh, we've kind of started getting away from the whole active shooter uh, and start to call them uh, active attacks. Uh, that just has to do with the methodology used. Um, they're starting to use other means now, uh, vehicles, knives, and other means to carry out these attacks. So that's kind of why we've adjusted on that. So the attacker, uh, really no profile. They have an Avenger mindset, some broadcast like on social media. Risk factors, they have a history of violence, exposure to violence, uh, maybe substance abuse or dependence, mental illness or history of suicide. Uh, stalking, harassing, threatening behavior, negative family dynamics and support system, isolation or instability or other concern. So this is a map of the U.S. and this has, uh, it'll list the attacks. So hold on, there we go. So it's from the year 2000. So if you look on the right, it kind of tells you uh, how to identify it. So the guns are yellow, uh, knife is red and car is blue. And small dots indicate under four and uh, the bigger ones are four and above. And you see it just progresses.
So this is just active attacks. This has uh, this is not gang violence or anything like that. This is purely active attacks. And it's kind of worrisome too, because you're like, you know, you see it in the news, but you're like, man, I don't remember seeing that many. And I think it just has to do with how, you know, if it's not something just crazy, you know, it doesn't get reported. And I just, you know, it's sad that it's like that, but 316 attacks in that amount of time. So this was kind of surprising to me whenever I first started looking at it, uh, the location of attacks. I always assumed, you know, maybe, uh, you know, education, you know, would be the highest number of attacks was actually commerce. Um, and that has to do with, you know, people that have relationships with that business, or maybe they don't. So this is the, the connection. So the cream, they have no connection uh, to the place that they're going to attack. And the 55%, they do have a connection. I thought that was pretty shocking too, because you know, just somebody one day just decided to pick, hey, I'm gonna go there and I'm gonna go attack these people. And I thought that was kind of alarming. So talking about, uh, you know, switching from active shooter to active events uh, at Santa Barbara. This is um, one of the first ones that the suspect, he initially started out with a knife and he stabbed three people and then he transitioned to a gun and then he actually got into a vehicle and uh, started hitting people. Uh, Orlando, Florida, I'm sure you remember this, uh, suspect killed 49 people. He was actually connected to the business. He had actually been a patron there several times. Las Vegas, uh, the highest uh, number of uh, people killed, it was 59 victims. Uh, a lot of people, what they, uh, what they found is they used hard cover uh, to protect themselves, and it really helped a lot of people survive. When I say hardcover, that's something that can stop bullets, right? So that would be like a rock wall, uh, opposed to like, let's say, like a wood privacy fence, you know? Uh, that would be concealment, you know, it hides you, but it doesn't stop bullets. Uh, cover hides you, and it also protects you from bullets. So it's important when you're in these events to think of that, think of where I could hide that could protect me. Uh, New York uh, suspect used a rented Home Depot truck to run people over. Uh, Sutherland Springs, 26 people killed, 20 wounded. Um, what stopped this is a neighbor heard the shooting, walked outside, saw a guy shooting at the church and got his own firearm, went out there, challenged the suspect and suspect fled. So the number of deaths we talk about. Uh, it really depends on two things, how quickly we arrive and target availability. Uh, a lot of times we talk, you know, to people and they're like, hey, you know, at school, you know, they're telling, uh, they're telling my kids, you know, if there's an active shooter event and the kids are in the hallway, you know, to jump inside a classroom. Well, why is that? Well, you can look at this picture of the, the hall at a school. You don't have to be a great shot to hit like 100 people if they're in that hallway, right? So we try to get them out of the way, you know, get them hidden. And then, you know, if they need to come up with another alternative, like escaping the building, go with that. Uh, it's just a way to get people out of the way. The average police response is three minutes. So what we tell people is, you know, we're on our way, but you need to really be able to sustain, sustain yourself and hide and get yourself squared away by the time of, uh, in that three minutes until we can get there and then we can uh, handle the situation. So talking about three stages of disaster, you have denial, deliberation, and that decisive moment. What we want to do is get out of denial. Um, I took a class with an officer. He, uh, he was in a parking lot and he heard, he heard some pops and he was like, is that fireworks? You know, he was off duty he was with his family and he was like, well, it's probably fireworks. Come to find out it was gunshots. And it's just our brains want to accept that, you know, everything's 
fine is probably nothing is probably just fireworks we want to get out of that and start going to deliberation hey what could i do uh where could i hide uh what could i do to survive and in that decisive moment where you act on that so this is a a cool little study that they did let me play the video for you plays like this street in new york city if you were unfortunate enough to be the victim of a crime or taken ill unexpectedly, you might think that surrounded by all these people, someone would intervene. After all, isn't there safety in numbers? Psychologists say no. Research suggests that often a victim is less likely to receive assistance when surrounded by a group rather than a single bystander. When people are in a crowd, it's easier to pass the buck. It's what psychologists call the diffusion of responsibility. Liverpool Street Station in London, a busy thoroughfare for commuters. Uh, uh, Unknown to these uh, passers-by, Peter uh, is an actor. Uh, As part of an experiment on bystander uh, apathy, he's pretending uh, to be ill. Help, help. Uh, How long before he gets help? Help. Help me, Please help me. Helping would be inconvenient or even help. risky. He lies there for more than 20 minutes and help. no one raises an eyebrow. Please, somebody help me. It's always very distressing to watch situations like this where people are obviously suffering and no one's actually helping them. But what we have here is two conflicting rules. One is the rule that we ought to help. And the other is the rule that we ought to do what everybody else is doing. And here you have a, a group of, effectively, a group of strangers who are exerting the pressure not to intervene, not to help. And it's very difficult to rebel. Ruth, another actor, takes Peter's place. How long before she receives help? Four minutes later, and 34 people have passed without stopping. Well, people don't really want to know that they just haven't got the time. Well, they have got the time, they just don't want to get involved. Unwittingly, these strangers have silently formed a temporary group with a rule, don't get involved. They're afraid to stand out from the crowd and won't take action if no one else does. This woman has clearly spotted Ruth, but she conforms to the rule and does nothing. Watch what happens, though, when someone else helps. You all right? You all right? Yes, thank you. you sure, you look a bit clicky, you know what I mean? She suddenly you finds sure. herself in a different group with a new rule to help. Uh, you want to sit up? You're going to look well, is she? Uh, you all right? Yeah, sure. First, I thought she was dead. Then I saw to check to see if she was breathing or not. And I looked around and I couldn't believe that no one had noticed her because there was a bloke sat there just absorbed in reading a newspaper. This time, Peter's dressed as a respectable gentleman. Now that his dress is in keeping with those around him, how long before he's rescued? Hello, sir. How are you today? I'm all right. Six thanks. seconds. <laughs> she even call? calls him sir, and suddenly no, everyone's fine. a good Samaritan. Do you suffer from epilepsy? No. Why you're lying on the floor in the rain? Because he's part of the right group. Everyone wants to help. I would just hate to be in his position of feeling ill um, and nobody helping and walking past, so I'd just like to check that he was okay. And I thought, well, it's wet, so he must really be ill because he's going to ruin his suit anyway. <laughs> so, why, why do people just walk by? I mean, ha I think it has to do with, you know, like they said, people not wanting to get involved. Um, if someone's lying there and someone thinks they're dead and people are just walking past them, you know, it goes through their mind, well, why is no one else helping, you know, and they don't want to look, you know, weird or they want to do what everyone else is doing because, you know, for whatever reason. And that's the, one of the keys to this class is being able to step outside that, you know, just because other people aren't reacting, that doesn't mean you shouldn't, uh, should empower you to uh, step up and act and get out of that denial phase. Plays like this. So they say, as far as deliberation, you have a human brain and a lizard brain. Your human brain, you 
you're in right now. You can uh, think about complex thoughts. Uh, you know, you think of a, a plan of action. A lizard brain is when it all goes to pot and you have to make a decision right then and there. What you can do is program your lizard brain. So have a plan before uh, something bad happens. So this has to do with like your places of business, like going through there, uh, your business. Hey, you know, maybe I need to put a lock on this copy room uh, in case people had a shelter in here. Uh, drilling, you know, hey, you know, let's kind of have a drill. You know, what will we do? Let's have an action plan and going through that and uh, just, you know, having a little bit of training and forethought that way, if it ever happens, you know, you're in a good, you're in a good predicament. Um, if you ever have the misfortune of having dinner or lunch with a cop, you'll see that police officers, they typically sit uh, with their, uh, with, with basically facing the door. And that is just our, uh, you know, unconscious, uh, subconscious way of, uh, just looking for threats. So if someone were to come through the door, you know, we could handle that and opposed to having our back towards it. Uh, other good, you know, uh, things to think about is like where to sit in a restaurant. Uh, a good spot is near the kitchen. A lot of people ask why it has to do with an exit. There's always an exit at the kitchen. So if you had to get out, you know, you could jump out and uh, run out the kitchen. And it's important that you like, let's say you're eating with your family to communicate that with them. Hey, if something were to happen, we're going to, we're going to leave through this door, you know, out of the kitchen, you know, and just be aware of that. Um, it's just, it's just good planning. So your human brain, the fight or flight, freeze. All right. So talking about stress response, uh, 60 beats per minute, it's your normal resting heart rate. Once you're starting to get into 90, uh, your gross motor uh, skills start or your fine motor skills start uh, shutting down a little bit. So that has to do with, uh, you know, hey, if there's ever an active shooter here, what I'm going to do is I'm going to get this key on my key ring that I have a thousand keys on and I'm going to try to lock this door. Well, at that point, it started to deteriorate. So it may not be such a feasible plan when you're trying to find that key and you're in a hurry and it may not go as smoothly as it would if uh, on a normal day to day. At 120, uh, your gross motor skills start shutting down a little bit. At 150, you get uh, what they call tunnel vision. Uh, it happens a lot uh, with new police officers, especially. Um, you get into a situation and you're like, oh my gosh. And all you see is one thing, you know, you don't really hear or see anything around you. So you have to be able to think about what's going on and recognize that in yourself and be able to pull yourself out of that and kind of look around. Uh, something that helps with that, uh, they developed in the army. We use it, it's called combat breathing. Uh, essentially what you do is you just take a deep breath, you hold it for two seconds, and then you exhale and then you keep doing that and uh, it helps lower your heart rate and kind of helps you get back down a little bit. So this is a video from a uh, shooting at a deli. And what I want you to pay attention to is the lady with the stroller. So you can see she's trying to unbuckle her kid she's probably undid that stroller thousands of times but it took her 10 seconds to get the kid out of the stroller and why is that and that's because her motors her fine motor skills are starting to shut down and something as simple as her unbuckling her kid that she's done a thousand times is now a lot harder so it's just that's a good example of how uh, it can stress can really affect you So I want you to look at this. This is an, uh, an outline of a building, and I want you to look at the exits and see how many exits you think there are. So when I'm counting, you have all the exterior doors, right? And most people would say, well, that's all the exits. But if you look in the front, there's a huge bank of windows right here. And there's more windows right here, and there's some more windows in the back. So what could we do? We could break out those windows if we had to get out, right? So if something really bad were to happen and we could not get to a door, we can break out windows. No one's going to get mad at you. You know, no, 
no cop's going to say anything to you, right? If you really have to get out, you can break out a window to get yourself to safety and get other people to safety. So this is a station nightclub. So that building that we saw, this is uh, an event that they had there. Uh, they had the Great White playing. I looked them up, they had some hits. But uh, they're doing a show and uh, this is what happened one night. You can see the pyrotechnic out the building on fire. Trying to get out of the building. So why do you think they were all trying to get out of that one door opposed to all those other doors that, that were around? Uh, I think it has to do with that's the way they came in. Um, they came in and that's the only way they knew instead of walking around the building uh it's a new new building maybe to them walking around saying hey there's a mercy exit here there's an exit here uh there's one by the bathroom walking around and doing that uh they just know the exit that uh that they came in and i think that's important especially when you know your business or when you're out with your family and you go to a new place you know hey you know tell your kids look there's a there's an emergency exit here there's a mercy exit here that way they know it really takes nothing just do an extra walk around and know all your exits. So that front door, that's eventually what it turns into. It gets so jam packed, people fall over and they're just stuck at that doorway and people are not able to get out. This is a diagram of that building. And all these dots that you see with the number, that's the number of dead. So you see this front entrance right here where they were trying to get out, 31 people actually died right there because they were unable to get out. If you look right here by the windows and the game tables, there's all these windows, 18 people died right there. Uh, nine people not too far away from them. There's actually an exit over here by the restrooms, three people died in that area. Um, the office, like we said, you know, there's windows back there. A couple of people died there. Uh, a couple of people died in the hall. Uh, if you look in the kitchen area or the video game area, nine people died there. There's actually an emergency exit right back here by the kitchen. So that's why it's so important to uh, know your exits and just familiarize yourself with uh, your build, uh, the surroundings that you're at. Talking about combat breathing, uh, shifting your emotion. If you're in one of these events, you're gonna be the most scared you've ever been. But if you can shift your emotion from being just terrified to I'm going to survive this, someone's not gonna take me from my family and that'll help you so much. Also staying fit, you know, uh, just helps out in every way as far as like being able to calm yourself and being able to get yourself out of situations. Talked about this, so script and practicing, you know, with my family, when we go out to somewhere, you know, if it's a new place, I'll say, hey, these are the emergency exits. Um, this is what we're going to do if something happens. If we do get separated, something like that, you know, this is where we're going to meet. Uh, as far as business, this is this is good because, you know, let's say, uh, you know, you have customers, some unruly customers sometimes, right? Uh it, it could always escalate. So script, practice, uh, you know, kind of what you would do in those scenarios. But then, you know, it also show your weakness because when you go through, be like, man, you know, uh, this is a, they have direct access to everyone. All they have to do is like jump over this counter or something like that. And it just kind of helps you think of ways to maybe get around that or improve your, 
uh, your business or your uh, your facility. So we're talking about, uh, you know, some people talk about one avenue is to play dead. And they figure, you know, if I play dead, you know, maybe uh, I won't get attacked. Um, I want to play a video from her name is Christina uh, Anderson. She was in the in Virginia Tech shooting and she was a victim in that. And she goes around now and she tours and she talks about her experience. And it's pretty awesome what she has to say. We heard the first shots at around 9.40 a.m. Uh, I was sitting on the wall of the classroom, so in the hallway, and I could hear the shots getting closer and closer very quickly. I mean, there was only a few seconds between the first time we heard them and when he actually walked in. To me, it sounded like um, an ax being taken to a piece of wood. And our teacher, she opened the door, and she peered outside, and she immediately shut the door, and she said, call 911. And Right then, he walked in just seconds after. Um, there's absolutely no time to, to think or to duck or to take cover. And people just kind of fell to the floor. And he immediately walked in shooting, and he went to the other side of the classroom, and he started going down the rows. He went down each row very quickly, very purposefully. Fully. And I remember thinking, your, your turn is coming. You're going to get shot. I mean, I didn't realize there was an active shooter, but I knew something bad was happening. He came back to our classroom three times, and on the third time, he killed himself in the front of the class. In between each time he was there, you could just hear people crying and coughing, and the cell phone started ringing. Um, when he was in our class, I remember trying not to breathe very much, so he couldn't tell I was alive. Because as my stomach was hitting the, the chair, I was thinking, you know, he can see me breathing, he can see me alive, and, and that was very scary. I'll never forget when the SWAT team first broke in um, at around 9.51. The officer in the front of the classroom said, we have a lot of blacks in here. And at the time, I couldn't comprehend what he was talking about, but he meant triage codes. And I remember looking into the girl to my right and realizing, you know, what black meant. He looked over me and he said, first he said yellow, and then he changed it immediately and he said red. And that's when I first started panicking. I still couldn't speak. I was shot three times, lying on my back. And I remember thinking, what do you see? Like, what can you see on me that I can't, that you would change me from yellow to red? He killed 12 people in my classroom, including our teacher. So I've got to see her speak a few times at uh, different police conferences. Um, and it's pretty awesome what she does. Like I said, she just goes around and she tells people her story and wants people to learn from it. You know, uh, her takeaway from it is don't play dead. You know, if you can defend yourself, defend yourself. Uh, essentially what happened in her case, they came in, a suspect came in, he shot him and he left. Um, you know, at that point, you know, people like, we're still alive, you know, you could barricade the door, uh, you know, try to escape, uh, what have you, just try to come up with a different plan. He ended up coming back several more times and uh, because some of the other rooms were locked and that's the only one he could really get in towards the end. And then he shot him a few more times. We heard uh, talking about hiding, uh, you know, it's one of those things where, you know, you if you can hide and get into a, in a secure area, that that would probably be your best bet. But uh, openly hide under a desk, something like that, that just sets you up for failure. So that's why it's real important to have that plan ahead of time. That way you're not relying on hiding underneath a desk or, uh, you know, a table. So that's our principle. So avoid, try to run, you know, as soon as it happens, if you can run, uh, if you have to, uh, bunker down, lock the door, uh, secure yourself. Uh, do you have any weapons at your work? That's something to think about too. Uh, most people would say they don't have weapons. You know, I teach this at schools and they're like, no, we're not allowed to have weapons at our school. It's like, okay, you don't have scissors. You don't have a fire extinguisher. 
uh, you're well within your legal right to defend yourself if someone's trying to murder you to defend yourself. So think about what you could use to defend yourself at your workplace. And like I said, lastly, if you have to defend yourself, this is a, a, a good video to show that. So this is actually a school board meeting and a gentleman walks in and he's upset because the school board actually fired his wife who was a teacher. And from the e-technology to notice that some of the uh, chart that you have there and it's part of the plan that we have that the workshop we're going to have following this meeting but uh, this will be the first step in that whole process i have a motion oh, uh, uh, I to everybody in this room behind that counter So you can see here, first of all, someone walks into a room and they spray paint V for Vendetta sign on a wall. It's probably your cue to leave, right? So that'd be a good time to take yourself out of that situation and call police. Mm -hmm. uh, the video kind of cuts off, but ultimately what happens is, so you saw, um, you know, Meemaw walks up behind him and hits a suspect with a purse. And he ends up turning his back on all these guys sitting there, the school board. So that would be a good time for you to act and uh, tackle him, take him down and, uh, you know, wait for police to get there. Instead, they've never thought about this situation before. Uh, I'm sure they're very, very scared. And essentially, he turns his back to them. They have plenty of time to, uh, to grab him. Uh, eventually, the suspect turns back around. I think he realizes that he just turned his back to him. And then uh, he starts talking to him again. Ultimately, he starts shooting. He misses everybody. Um, and off duty, or uh, I guess a police officer that was working an uh, overtime job, heard the shots, came inside. And suspect actually uh, ended up killing himself. So no one else was killed in this except for the suspect. But that's just a good indication of having that plan. You know, hey, if something were to happen at one of these meetings, you know, this is what I'm going to do. And, uh, you know, the first opportunity I have, if I have to fight, I'm going to take that opportunity. So, like we talked about, leaving as soon as possible, know all your exits, and call 911. It does, it's not going to benefit you to call 911 when the suspect's right in front of you with a gun. Get yourself out of that situation, then call 911. We don't have teleport a cop yet. We're working on it. It's in its beta phase, but <laughs> until we get teleport a cop up, uh, just uh, you know, leave, be safe, and call 911. Try to get a dis good description of the suspect. You know, he's a white male. He has a He's wearing a blue hoodie and blue jeans, you know, uh, that way police have a better idea when we get there. This is that deli shooting I talked about earlier. Since the suspect walks in with a gun, you can see people, you know, trying to get out of there as fast as possible. This is that same uh, deadly shooting. People ran to the back, um, and we talked about you know your your body, how it how you're uh, you're you're affected by stress. So there's some different exits here that we can take advantage of. Uh, there's a door right there. That you see where the red arrow is. The guy actually pushes on the door, but he doesn't push on the crash bar uh, to open the door. So he pushes the door. The door doesn't open, and he's so amped up. I think he didn't realize you know you know, oh, I got to push the crash bar to open. Uh, there's a ladder there to get you out on the roof. Uh, instead, they're just kind of hiding in plain sight. Uh, if you were in this scenario, there's no other uh, 
exits, what you could do is try to barricade that door so he can't get in there and then find something to defend yourself. So if he does get in there, uh, you stand a good chance. Obviously lock the doors, uh, turn the lights out and uh, hide out of sight. You know, you don't ever want to stand in front of a door. As a police officer, that's something we learned on day one. If you stand in front of the door, you stand a chance of getting shot because bullets go through doors. Um, we had an officer a couple of years ago. We got a call for service as a medical call. The officer shows up, knocks on the door. Luckily, he's just training, wasn't standing in front of the door, and the guy started shooting through the door. And if the officer didn't use his training, you know, he would end up getting shot by those bullets. So it's just real important not to stand in front of doors. Uh, barricade yourself. Uh, heavier, the better. Uh, the more, the better. If even if the door, like we said, opens outwards, right, at least there's stuff there in front of the door. Uh, if he's having to move stuff like chairs and desks, what is he not doing? He's not shooting, right? So that gives you an opportunity to attack him or whatever you have to do. Other place, other things you could use for like barricades. Simple door stops work well. Uh, ropes, you know, tying them around doors, pulling on them. Uh, if you saw in the video, the guy used his belt and put around the system at the top of the door, uh, that, that kind of middle hinge. And once you do that, it's almost impossible to open up the door if it's cinched down tight. They sell a lot of different locks that you can buy for your uh, businesses. A lot of schools have implemented this. So uh, I'm sure you're familiar with Sandy Hook. Uh, suspect walks in and to an elementary, and he starts uh, he starts shooting uh, some kids. Uh, there's a teacher her name is Caitlin Rogue. She's a hero in my mind, and uh, she really saved a lot of kids that day. So here's her video. That all day we have met people who remind us what teachers do how much they care, even in the face of terror. And I sat down with a first grade teacher at that school, Caitlin Roick. She heard gunfire, large windows exposed her classroom. So she managed to rush 15 small children into a tiny bathroom to try to save their lives. I put one of, one of my students on top of the um, toilet. Dispenser. I just knew we had to get in there. And I was just telling them it's gonna be okay. You're going to be all right. I, I had pulled a bookshelf before I closed the door in front of it. So it was completely, we were completely barricaded in. I turned the lights off. Did you tell them to be quiet? Did you oh, yes. worry about one of them? No, I told them. I told them to be quiet. I told them we had to be absolutely quiet um, because I was just so afraid that if he did come in and then he would hear us and then he would maybe just start shooting the door. So I said, no, we just have to be absolutely quiet. Um, and we have, I said, there are bad guys out there now. We need to wait for the good guys. I'm going to get, I just, I, I just, I wanted us to be okay. And I'm so, so saddened that there are people who, who in this situation are not okay. Um, and my heart, my heart goes out to anyone who knew them and was a part of their lives. I, I just can't imagine. Did they cry? No, if they started crying, I would like take their face and say, it's gonna be okay, show me your smile. Like I really tried to like, ha you know, and one of my students was, you know, would say like things like, I know karate, so it's okay, I'll lead the way out. Like, they really said to you, we wanna go home for Christmas. Oh yeah, oh yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Or I just wanna hug my mom or just, you know, things like that that were just, just heartbreaking, you know? And like in my mind, I mean, cause you're hearing, I've never been a part of something, obviously, anywhere near this traumatic. Um, and so I'm hearing the gunfire in the hallway, and I'm thinking in my mind, I, I'm the first classroom. Why isn't he coming? You know, I'm thinking, we're next. And, you know, and in my mind, I'm thinking, you know, as as a six-year-old, seven-year-old, what are you, what are your thoughts? What are your, you know, and I'm, I'm thinking that I have to, to almost be their parent. Like, I have to tell them, you know, so I said to them, I said, I need you to know that I love you all very much and that it's going to be okay because I thought that was the last thing they were ever going to hear. I thought we were all going to die. Um, you know, and I don't know if that's okay, you know, teachers and, you know, but I wanted them to know someone loved them and I wanted them that to be one of the last things they heard. Uh, not not the gunfire in the hallway. Uh, it's just so horrible. It's just so horrible. Horrible.
horrible, horrible. Um, How did you know you were going to be okay? What happened? I didn't. Um, what finally happened was the gunfire stopped. The gunfire wasn't um, that long, um, so that stopped. But I, st I said, no, we're not going right. anywhere. We're right. staying here um, until someone good comes in. Um, sorry, gets us out. So eventually, what happened was the police came and started knocking. Um, and obviously, I mean, I was completely beside myself. And I said, I don't, I don't believe you. Um, you need to put your badges under the door. Um, so they put their badges under the door. I said, if you're really a police officer, then you would have a way to get in here. You would have a key, or you would have gotten it from the jam. If everything's OK now, you would have found the keys. So he had the keys, and he found the right one, and he unlocked the door. And then they brought us out to the um, firehouse to meet up with the rest of um, the teachers and students waiting for parents to come and pick them up. I think there are a lot of people who wish. So, like I said, she's a hero, right? She thought about this. She thought, you know, if the day ever comes where someone's going to come and try to hurt the kids, that, you know, basically her kids, what, what would I do? And she said, you know, I'm going to hide in this closet. I'm going to tell everyone to be quiet and just keep people out of sight and she did and she kept them safe so she is a hero she had that forethought and i mean i think we should all you know take what she did and learn from that that all day um if you have to uh, talk about denying hide you know position yourself you know like i said don't stand in front of the door if you stand to the left or right of the door and if they do come in with a gun, you know, grab the gun, uh, fight them, uh, get that gun away from them and hold them down for police. Um, this is that uh, belly shooting I was talking about. You see this guy with the hat, he sees something's going on and he grabs a bottle of wine and he's ready to take it to him, you know. Uh, ultimately he doesn't, but you know, he thought, you know, I'm going to grab something to defend myself if I have to. So it's really, you know, what you do matters. You know, it matters a great deal in your survivability. When the attack starts, a little flow chart, primary exits, you know, avoid them. If there's not any good exits, deny them entry. Uh, look for other exits. No, then defend yourself. Talk to you a little bit about Virginia Tech uh, with Christina a Anderson. This is Norris Hall. This is where it all happened. Uh, those doors, he actually went in there and chained those doors shut so police couldn't get in there or had a harder time getting inside. Uh, this is the second floor where the attacks occurred. So you kind of see. Uh, Started 206, 207, her classroom was 211. Uh, 204, uh, what happened, they heard the shots. The professor goes over there, tells kids, hey, break these windows out, get out. He's sitting there holding the door with another student. Several kids get out. Uh, the suspect ends up shooting the door, hitting the professor, but a lot of lives were saved that day just from his action of you know hey get out uh, see these other rooms uh he just they were able just to come in and come in and out 205 uh no one was able to get in there because the students actually laid down on the floor and they barricaded the doors with their feet and um, the suspect wasn't able to get inside So you can see how a little bit of prevention goes a long way. So when we arrive, make sure you follow our commands, uh, show us your hands and, you know, importantly, don't make any sudden movements. We don't know what's going on. When we get these reports, you know, there could be three different descriptions of the same person, you know? So we don't know how many people there are. The best thing you can do is hands up, you know, don't put your cell phones in your hands or anything like that, just show us your hands. You know, that's the most important thing. As a police officer, we're, we learned that hands kill. So just hands up and let us, you know, sort, sort everything out and make sure that everybody's safe. So our primary focus uh, when we start, you know, stop the killing, right? Uh, when we come in there, 
uh, we have to make sure that the suspect is stopped uh, one way or the other. Once he's neutralized and, uh, you know, as far as like being in custody, uh, we have to stop the dying. So what we do, we've worked a lot with EMS and the fire department as far as them coming into a warm zone and basically warm, meaning that there's no more shots being fired, but there's still a potential of something going on. So we they have body armor. They come in with us under guard and then they start caring for people and getting them to the hospitals that they need to go to. It's kind of an example of like when police ready? arrive. If you're not cool, I'm not walking them, dude. Sir? Cousin, cousin. that deputy around keep your hands right to see him. Always that deputy. You're going to make the left of the deputy's out. Probably not a great time to be recording uh, what's going on. But Thank you. Thank you. You can see their hands are in the air and the officers are just I'll take a bullet before you do that for damn trying, sure. trying to get them out of the harm's way and just trying to get them to safety. Uh, medical training. This is something that you really need to look at. Uh, you know, it could be a little bit before, you know, like I said, EMS gets there because when we get there, we have to take care of the suspect. We can't, you know, have him, we can't be working on somebody and providing them medical aid while he's shooting three other people, you know, that doesn't make sense. So if you take that upon yourself to get medical training or get medical supplies, uh, you know, that's a huge thing and just have those around and have the knowledge base to be able to take care of people until EMS can get in there. This is a, it's called a, a cat five. Uh, it's a it, so it's a it's a cat tourniquet, right? Uh, we use these uh, right now. We uh, carry them on our vest. Uh, they're a great tool. Uh, we had a guy that was stabbed a few weeks ago, and the officer put that on his arm and saved his life. It's just a fantastic tool uh, to have. You know, they you can buy them on Amazon. You can buy them, you know, at different medical places, and uh, they're relatively inexpensive for what they are. And just having those on staff, man, I mean, it's, that could be a, that's a lifesaver right there. Just that, the knowledge base to use them. Uh, Williams County has this class. It's called Stop the Bleed, uh, Williams County EMS. Fantastic class. It kind of teaches you about uh, a little bit more than first aid and how to use the tourniquets. And it's just a great training. And that's, you know, if that's something you want to bring to your office or personally, you know, that's just a fantastic training. So like I said, Williams County EMS puts that on. As far as like a business standpoint, you know, it's going to be it's going to be a rough patch. You know, you got to think about, you know, what you're going to do. Uh, and it's better to have a plan in place before. So if you can think about, you know, hey, if we had a, a traumatic event here, I already have these people that we can reach out for my employees to get help, uh, you know, you know, uh, different people for them to talk to counselors. And uh, think about like, as far as like, you know, eventually your business is going to have to get up and going, but you know, you may have to think there's some hard things with that, you know, like uh, uh, Sandy Hook, uh, they ended up like tearing down that whole uh, elementary because, you know, who really wants to go back when an awful thing like that happened, you know? So there can be a lot to really think about and plan as far as one of these events. And it's, like I said, this whole class is, you know, better have a plan uh, beforehand than whenever it happens and you're scrambling. Uh, we never name the suspect. Uh, we always call them suspect or, you know, the offender uh, because we don't want them to get any uh, notoriety off of it. So this young lady is Victoria Soto. She was also a teacher at Sandy Hook. Um, she is a hero as well. She uh, hit her kids in the room best she could. He came in and said, where's your kids at? She said, you know, they're not here. Uh, some of the kids ended up getting scared and came out, but he ended up killing Victoria and some of the kids. But, you know, she really, she really did try her best to try to protect those kids. So Angela McQueen, she's a, a PE teacher. And she has lunch duty. She sees uh, somebody tells her, hey, this kid has a gun. So she walks over to the kid at the lunch table and is like, hey, do you have a gun? And he kind of stands up, gets defensive. He ends up going for it. She grabs the gun. The kids just start firing rounds into the air. Once the 
he's out of bullets. She takes him down to the ground and uh, holds him there until police get there and are able to arrest him. So, you know, she wasn't afraid to challenge him and do what she had to do to protect those kids. So what can you do as a business owner slash leader? Like we talked about, evaluate your facility, ask security, look at your locks. Uh, do I need to add a lock to this particular room? Uh, would it be beneficial in case we ever had to hide here? Uh, places to hide. What could you use as a barricade? And having medical supplies, you know, it probably wouldn't hurt to have a couple of cases of water on hand, you know, or maybe some snacks, you know. Uh, people with diabetic issues, anything like that, you know, just, you know, be prepared in case that happens and you have to bunker down a little bit longer than what you're expecting. Uh, plan, get an evacuation plan, you know, we're going to leave, you know, here, uh, make sure everyone meets, you know, you can meet at this location if you think that's a good idea. If not, make sure you call me and we'll try to uh, get together who all uh, is outstanding have a crisis plan, like I said, you know, have all that uh, beforehand. If something bad does happen, you're able to point your employees uh, or whoever to a uh, to some knowledgeable people. Uh, employee intervention, you know, just, you know, it doesn't hurt to, you know, talk to your employees and have that relationship, you know. Somebody's going through a hard time, you know, just try to be aware of that. You know, if you see drastic changes in them, you know, there might be some options out there as far as trying to get them some help, you know, so, you know, nothing, it doesn't ever turn violent. Uh, training, craze training, uh, this class is absolutely free. Uh, if you ever want me to put it on for your business, it's absolutely free. I come out, I love to do it. Like I said, you know, this is one of my passions and I've done it since 2016. So uh, just get a hold of me. Uh, Tony can give you my email. Uh, training, get that medical training. You know, anything you can do just to, you know, be ahead of the curve, get that medical training, get, you know, stop the bleed training, uh, CPR, first aid, uh, just something where, you know, you're all trained up and everyone's competent in it. So at the end of the day, like I said, you know, what you do matters. Uh, you know, I applaud you for, you know, uh, taking this class, it is really a big step, and I'm always glad when people do because, you know, hopefully it helps you and it's eye opening. Like I said, this time, first time I've ever had to do it virtual, so I don't get to see all your faces and uh, answer your questions right off the mm -hmm. bat, but hopefully it was beneficial to you. Uh, like I said, just I appreciate y'all being here and thank y'all. All right. Thank you, Corporal. Um, I, I know that uh, we had one question that you you didn't answer in, in your talk um and it was uh would you recommend a drill inside an office would you let them know how would you would you let them know ahead of time that it's going to be we're going to have a drill that we're going to take this seriously what would you do yeah so i would definitely just uh you know call the pd uh you can call me and say hey do you want to just sit in on it and i'd be happy to i do this a lot for businesses churches schools and you know kind of just sit there and it doesn't hurt to have an extra pair of eyes just to be able to watch and you know hey have y'all ever thought about this or if y'all are doing something awesome you know I can take that and bring to other people um, an example is I went to a school one time and they had a, it was a two-story school and their plan for the second story where the second graders were was if there was anything happened they were going to break out the windows and the second graders were or the uh, second graders were going to jump out of the windows onto the ground from the second story and I said, well, what happens when people break, all the kids break their legs? And they're like, well, why would they break their legs? Because like, it's the second story. And I think that really helped them understand, oh, well, no one thought about that. And it's just, you know, and as silly as it seems, no one had thought about that. And they had to like change their plan from there. So it just goes to show just, you know, extra pair of eyes never hurts. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Thank you again, Corporal. Thank you for uh, taking time to talk to, to these leaders. Um, I know it's, it's sobering stuff, um, stuff that we don't like thinking about. You know, uh, a lot of times uh, ignorance is bliss, um, but, but always having a plan, thinking through what would you do, what could you use is, is important. So uh, again, I appreciate it. Uh, thank you to our sponsor, Cedar Park Economic Development. Thank you for spending some of your time with us this morning. Um, and be sure to look for the next Chamber University. And with that, uh, everybody have a great day. Thank you again, Corporal. Bye. Thank you.